Hello everyone, I'm Tim from Tim Does Level Design and welcome to lesson 3 of my beginner course in video game level design. In the previous lesson, we looked at 3 C's and started setting up a gym level to find some desired metrics to use as guidelines for level layouts. I've also made some improvements to my 3C gym and set up test cases, like you should have done as part of your homework exercise. For comparison, let's take a look at how I've set things up. Over here, we find the basic jump margins we settled on in the previous lesson. For the jump plus double jump values, I figured the best minimum height would be the same as the 250 value of the minimum blocker height we found in the last lesson. And for the maximum height, I settled on 375, as above this value, things start feeling less comfortable. Remember, what I tried to find out here are the acceptable margins, not the absolute maximum values. Though while testing things, I did often scale up blocks to find the maximum values to get a sense of how big the margins need to be to feel comfortable. And don't worry if the values you landed on aren't exactly the same as mine. Decisions like this can be down to personal preference and, for example, the expected skill level for your audience and needs for accessibility. Down here, we find my setups for the jump distances, where for a single jump, the maximum comfortable distance I found was 300 units. I also define the minimum value of 450 units for a jump that cannot be reached with a single jump. As again, if the values are too close to a reachable jump, players won't be able to intuit whether or not they can make the jump. In this same section, I added my test of the maximum comfortable jump plus double jump distance, for which I landed on 520 units. I've laid out the gym level so that everything connects from the middle point, hopefully making it a bit quicker to move to the area you want to test. For a max step-up height, I settled on 25 units, as a value like 45 can still be stepped on but looks awkward, with the player sort of teleporting upwards. And last but not least, I settled on 525 units as the max comfortable height for a ledge where we intend the player to use double jump and teleport. At 725 units, I can still just about make the jump on some occasions, so beware of players being able to reach greater heights than you might think with these abilities unlocked. Now, if we're a solo developer and handling all aspects of our game development, this gym would already come in very handy to test some of our core mechanics. And if we would, for example, want to change the jump height or the effect of gravity on a character, we would have some good test cases set up to see how the changes would affect our interaction with the environment and we can adjust the margins we need. But if we revisit this gym after months of development, the context of what we were doing here exactly and which values we found are easily forgotten. And if, let's say, we're a level designer working with a development team, we might be setting up this gym level for a game designer and programmer to sit down and tweak our game's values and mechanics together. So let's place ourselves in the mindsets of someone who needs to use our gym and make some improvements to give them a bit of context. In our standard map template, I've already pre-placed a dev panel but as a test, let's select this actor and press the delete key. In our content drawer, when we navigate to our content folder, we find a folder called LD underscore logic. Here, I've added some blueprints to help you set up test levels and prototypes. Just like we did with the static mesh actors, we can drag the BP underscore dev text from our content drawer into our viewport and move it wherever we want using the translate tool. Let's keep it nice and central in our layout, close to our player start, so it's visible right away when someone loads up this gym. With our dev panel selected, in the details panel, you see that I've exposed a few text fields. You can fill those out with any text you want, which will then be displayed on the dev panel. For this panel as a header, let's type in 3C gym. And for context, we type test character metrics in this level. When filling out these test fields, you might see that the dev panel in the viewport doesn't get updated or displays its default values. This is because construction graphs in Unreal aren't automatically refreshed in cases like this. Don't worry about that stuff right now. Just know that if you move or scale the blueprint actor, the text updates, 
and when we press play, it will always show properly in the game as well. Now I'll copy and paste this dev text and move it towards the jump height setup. I'll add the title Jump Height Margins and use this dev panel as a little signpost so anyone using the gym can quickly find their way. We might also want to add some text without this big cumbersome panel. For this, let's explore a new way of quickly adding actors to our levels. In the toolbar above our viewport, we can click this little icon of a cube and a green plus symbol to expand it. This window is a quick way to search for and add existing content, whether it's Unreal Engine default or we've created it ourselves. In the search bar at the top, type in text and select the text render actor, which is by default included in our Unreal project. Let's drag it somewhere we want to add a note and rotate it 90 degrees as that's how our levels and gameplay are oriented. I'll check the height value I set on the block, which is 200, and with the text render actor selected in the details panel, I set the text to display 200. When I populate the gym level with panels and text actors, leaving notes where I think they help giving context, the whole functionality of the gym should be a lot more clear to anyone using it. Now that we've explored the basic 3Cs of our game, I think it's time we get familiar with the enemies our players can encounter. In our Maps folder, let's duplicate our map template again. And this time, name it map underscore gym underscore combat and open it up. I'll quickly expand the floor a bit to create some room and delete the level transition actor for now. In our content folder, we can find a folder I've created called enemies. When we drag in the skeleton enemy and press play, we can see that the skeleton enemy is now spawned in our map. It's easy as that. The same goes for the golem, the necromancer and the eye chaser enemy. Just be careful when placing them that their Y axis value is set to zero, as otherwise the player might not overlap with them. And when rotating them, make sure they're only rotated either zero or 180 degrees or else, due to the 2.5D perspective of our game, we'll also see some funky stuff happening. For the Golem, I built in a little extra functionality. With the Golem selected in the Details panel, you can find Initial Attack Delay. This allows you to set a value in seconds, which will give an extra pause to the first attack launched by the Golem. This will come in handy when you wish to set up particular timings in your levels later. Dragging in our bat enemy, we find it also facilitates a bit of extra setup. In the details panel, you can add a custom value as its patrol rate. The higher the value, the faster the bat moves between two points. Those two points you can find and select in a components overview called POS1 and POS2. With either of them selected, you can use the Translate tool to move them to any position in your level that you'd like, allowing you to tailor its flight path for your level design needs. I've also created a handy overview of the enemies and a small list of player abilities on a public mirror board that you can use as a cheat sheet. I'll add a link to the board in the video's description below. In previous game companies I've worked for, I've seen Miro being used more and more often, so I wanted to at least mention it in this series. Miro or other competing digital workspaces are being used for various game design documents, concept art, production planning and general brainstorming. In bigger companies, you'll find more specializations, such as combat designers, who will provide you as a level designer and the rest of the team with this type of information. But the smaller the team, the more those kind of responsibilities overlap. Though of course, the documentation tends to be a lot more elaborate than this brief example. Or, to be honest, in some game projects, crucial documentation can be infuriatingly absent for the longest of time. Anyhow, back to our project. You may have already noticed that when you place actors, they show up in this little list in the top right of your screen, called the Outliner. 
The outliner gives us a handy overview of all actors placed in our level. Let's drag out the panel a bit to give us a better view. When we close the folders in this view by clicking on a little arrow icon next to them, we see that everything we've placed is not part of any folder. Let's select all enemies in the outliner by holding down shift and clicking on the others. With all of them selected, let's press the little folder icon on top to create a new folder. When we right click and navigate to edit, we can press rename to rename this folder enemies. As a shortcut to rename things, you can also press the F2 button. When we collapse the folder, we can see this has tidied up our structure a bit. Whenever you have an existing folder, you can drag something in the outliner directly into it. It doesn't seem like a very important thing, but when your levels get bigger and more complex, it's very handy to find specific things when you need to. When testing our enemies in our gym, we'll want to see how challenging or easy certain setups are with different health amounts and abilities unlocked. For this, I've created another blueprint called BP underscore player modifier. This should already be placed in the template level by default, but if you can't find it, you can drag it into your viewport from the LD underscore logic folder in our content drawer. Make sure there's always just one player modifier present in your level to avoid any weird bugs. If you select the player modifier, in the details panel, you can see a couple of variables I've set up for you to edit. When you enable Override Player Health, you can input a custom amount of hit points for the player to start with. Similarly, you can set a custom amount of arrows and modify the max arrow count. By unticking or ticking the ability boxes, you can choose which ability the player has available in this specific level. Hopefully you've managed to absorb all that new information and you're ready for this lesson's homework assignment. To get to know the enemies in our game a little bit better, I'd like you to build out your combat gym, so you can use it yourself to play around with different enemies, enemy combinations and with various player modifications. I won't expect any particular standard or method of setup. As long as the gym helps you try out different stuff, it's all good. As a bit of extra practice, I would also like you to add a test for one small level section to your gym level that's rather difficult to overcome without an ability unlocked, but a lot easier when the player does have that ability. For example, this lineup of golems that is possible though difficult to overcome without double jump and becomes quite easy with the double jump ability unlocked. You're welcome to use a different setup using double jump or choose one of the other abilities. By the next lesson, I hope you've built a decent understanding of the different types of enemies and challenges we can face in our game. Please do like and subscribe and hit that notification bell down below to get notified when the next video goes live. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.